12. Most Brutal Jason Voorhees Kills Slasher films are known best for their brutal murders, and while the horror genre, particularly the slash subgenre, has seen many such franchises over the decades, one that stands out and shines through in terms of brutal serial killer and his gruesome kills is the Friday the 13th franchise. Welcome to New York. The man behind the murders is none other than Jason Voorhees, the mass serial killer who has certain signature moves when it comes to killing his victims, but still does manage to come up with new and creative ways to kill people. Jason made his first appearance in Friday the 13th, which was released in 1980, and then appeared in 11 more films, killing more and more people as time passed by. He has killed over 200 people, some of which were seen on screen, and some were off screen. This video talks about the 12 most brutal kills by Jason Voorhees, from using his signature machete to drowning someone in liquid nitrogen. These kills include teenagers, camp counselors, and deputies, mostly in and around Springwood, Ohio. So keep the popcorn aside as we delve into some of the most brutal murders in the history of slasher cinema. Let's begin shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Adrian Hart, face frozen with liquid nitrogen and destroyed on a counter. Jason X, 2002. This scene finishes in less than 120 seconds and yet is an extremely jarring experience because you barely have time to process what happens. Adrian Thomas Hart is portrayed by Christy Angus and she plays the role of an intern working at New Harvard University on Earth 2. Adrian acts as the assistant of university teacher Professor Braywaith Lowe. Adrian has been given a job of dissecting Jason's body. Despite the warnings, as she continues her work, she notices Jason's body gone and barely has time to react as he grabs her face from behind, throwing her into a wall. She tries to scream for help, but much to her dismay, no one hears her. He drags her to the table and holds her head above a tub of liquid nitrogen. Adrian continues to scream for help before he dunks her face into the tub, freezing it immediately. Now, one might think that this is where it ends, but it isn't long before Jason slams her face to the counter as it shatters into pieces. He leaves her lifeless body on the floor, which is discovered later. Despite being one of the lesser loved films of the franchise, Jason maintained his style while he committed the murders. Trapped upside down in a sleeping bag and roasted to death over a campfire. Friday the 13th, 2009. Although the film opens in the year 1980, this brutal death takes place 29 years later. Five teenagers, including Wade, Whitney, Richie, Amanda, and Mike, are hiking through the woods, trying to find a plot of marijuana. They eventually set up camp there, and Wade tells them the story about Jason Voorhees. And everyone is quick to brush it off as they go their separate ways to spend the night. And this is when the terror strikes. Soon, Wade discovers the plot of marijuana, but seconds later, he is confronted by Jason Voorhees, who is wearing a burlap sack over his face. Jason murders Wade by slashing his face with a machete. Richie and Amanda have their private moment interrupted when Amanda thinks someone is watching them. Richie goes outside to check and he finds Wade's body. Moreover, his failed attempt to warn Amanda leads to Jason breaking into their tent and dragging Amanda out, who is still in a sleeping bag. She is hung over the bonfire, soon catching fire as she is burned alive, and Richie watches this scene in pure shock and horror. Jason then proceeds to kill Mike and Richie, and kidnaps Whitney because of her resemblance to Pamela Voorhees, Jason's mother. Motherfucker. Julius Gaw, decapitated with a single punch. Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. 1989. The build-up and anticipation that the scene brings to the audience are probably what makes it one of the most brutal deaths. It isn't very often that we see a victim of Jason Voorhees put up a fight, but Julius Gaw truly tried his level best. Julius! 
Julia Samuel Gaw was a student graduating from Lakeview High School while on a cruise to New York City. Julius hears about the possibility of Jason being on the same ship as them and decides to gather some students to hunt him down. Although he does come face to face with Jason, he makes it out alive. It isn't until after they reach New York when Julius is confronted by him again. Only this time, Julius has nowhere to go. And so, he puts up the fight of his life, throwing punches on Jason's covered face and torso until they reach the edge. Julius has exhausted himself beyond the point of recovery, breathless, with bleeding knuckles. And this is when Jason takes a moment before he throws one single punch, decapitating Julius' head from his body, which is later found by the police. Julius was Jason's 82nd victim. Mark Jarvis struck in the face with a panga machete. Friday the 13th, Part 2, 1981. An eerie atmosphere paired with a thunderstorm, a serial killer on the loose, and a disabled man who can't possibly fend for himself truly is a recipe for a brutal murder. Former athlete Mark Jarvis, portrayed by Tom McBride, is a young man who is bound to a wheelchair after a motorcycle accident. He volunteers along with several others to attend the counselor training center at Packenack Lodge near Crystal Lake. Although commonly, one can't predict a Jason Voorhees murder. This one is just a little more shocking. As the rain begins to pour heavily, Mark ventures out on his wheelchair, thinking someone is out there. The audience patiently anticipates, probably guessing Jason Voorhees to attack Mark from behind, which is why it's shocking when he's attacked right in the middle of his face with a panga machete. His wheelchair moves backwards because of the force and topples down a flight of stairs. Later. His body, along with a few others, were found by the police and taken to the morgue. Mark was officially Jason's second victim, who died because of his signature machete. He was also Jason's first and last disabled victim. <gasps> Trey Cooper stabbed ten times with a machete and folded in half in a bed. Freddy vs. Jason, 2003 Trey Cooper was born somewhere around the year 1985, and as a young man from Springwood, Ohio, to put it in the simplest of ways, he wasn't a very nice guy. He fell into the stereotype jerky category that we often see in the horror genre, especially slasher films. He was mean and most times outright cruel with the complete intention of being his way. On a rainy night, Trey, along with his best friend Blake Mueller, decided to crash a gathering at Lori Campbell's house, which included his girlfriend Gib Smith. Trey and Gibb decided to make the most of this opportunity and make love in one of the bedrooms. They had to light the candles when the power went out, and once they were done, Gibb went in for a shower when Jason Voorhees entered the house and made his way to the bedroom. Unaware of the presence, Trey was still on the bed, lying on his stomach with a beer in his hand. This was when Jason stabbed him in the back with the machete, ten times before pulling each end of the bed inwards, folding his body and snapping his spine in half. Rick Bombay, head crush which causes his left eye to pop. Friday the 13th, Part 3, 1982. Rick Bombay was portrayed by Paul Kratka and played the role of a country boy who was Christine Higgins' boyfriend. Although Rick's death wasn't as gruesome or bloody as the ones we've witnessed so far, it is one of the more brutal ones, the kind that makes you scrunch your nose in disgust and look away. Yeah. Sometime before his death, Christine had told him about why she came back to Higgins Haven, and it had to do with her encounter with the hideously deformed man that attacked her. Later, Christine and Rick part ways for just a moment as Rick goes outside, where he is quietly attacked from behind by none other than Jason Voorhees. Christine comes outside to try and figure out what happened, but our poor guy's mouth is covered unable to scream for help. As soon as she gets back inside, Jason takes this opportunity to crush Rick's head, which results in his left eye popping out the socket. Soon after, Christine discovers his dead body and attempts to revive him but fails. This is one of Jason Voorhees' most brutal kills because we see just how easily he crushes that head, with no machete, no axe, no liquid nitrogen, just his bare hands. Sissy Baker, demonstrated and head twisted off. Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives, 1986. Bad things always seem to happen when movies take place at a summer camp. And unfortunately for Sissy Baker, this horror trope is no exception. Sissy, portrayed by Renee Jones, is a counselor at Camp Crystal Lake, 
who jokes that she would rather deal with Jason Voorhees than the children at the camp. Oh, I'd rather deal with old Jason. It seems Sissy never heard of being careful what you wish for because what follows is most certainly gruesome and nightmare inducing. When a frightened camper comes to her in the middle of the night, Sissy assures her that there's nothing to be afraid of. But the audience knows that simply isn't true. Afterward, Sissy hears a noise at her window and wanders over, only to be grabbed by the shoulders and pulled straight out the window by Jason. Her screams go unnoticed by the other counselors because she is silenced rather quickly. Sissy sees things from a new point of view, backwards, when Jason twists her head around and rips it off, leaving her body twitching as it falls to the ground. Originally, Sissy's death was meant to happen off screen, which would have robbed the viewers of one of the most brutal Jason Voorhees murders. Daniel Carter, punch through the chest and neck snap, Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, when Dan Carter and his girlfriend Judy Williams portrayed by Michael Schroeder and Deborah Kessler, respectively, decide to go camping together near Crystal Lake, they certainly do not expect their trip to end so abruptly. Judy repeatedly asks Dan to fetch some more firewood since the night is only going to get cold, but in response, Dan comes on to her saying, let me heat you. Annoyed, Judy returns to the tent, and Dan finally grabs his machete and goes off to cut more wood for the campfire, while Judy gets undressed and gets ready for bed. Dan wanders alone in the dark cutting more firewood. As is usually the case in these films, Dan makes the mistake of being unaware of his surroundings. He carries the firewood back toward the tent, but Jason comes up behind him and punches his fist directly through his chest, simultaneously using his other hand to snap his neck. Jason takes Dan's machete and makes his way to the tent where Judy is waiting, unaware that Jason is outside, and not Dan, which doesn't end well for Judy. Charles McCullough, Garbage Can Drowning, Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, 1989. In this Friday the 13th sequel, one of Jason's victims is Charles McCullough, a high school biology teacher and the abusive uncle of Rennie Wickham. He is also chaperoning a senior class trip. The trip is a cruise to New York City aboard the SS Lazarus, and as to be expected, Jason murders several students aboard the ship. McCullough is one of the few to escape, alongside his niece Rennie, her boyfriend Sean, and English teacher Colleen Van Dusen. They row the rest of the way to New York City in a lifeboat, but Jason follows them, stalking them through the streets. Calm down, will you? You heard what he said? They'll kill her! We have to find the police! When Jason catches up to him, McCullough attempts to hide, running into some sort of building. It takes only a moment for Jason to throw McCullough out the window, and before he can get up off the ground, Jason drags him over to a barrel of toxic waste. He forces him into the barrel, face down, and drowns him, leaving his body there once he stops moving. Charles is also one of the two secondary antagonists of this film, and Jason's 49th victim. Dude, no. Scott Stubbs, electrocuted with a console through machete. Freddy vs. Jason, 2003. Deputy Scott Stubbs, portrayed by Lokland Monroe, is a law enforcement officer at Springwood County Sheriff's Department in Springwood, Ohio. He was fairly new to the department, having worked there for only a few months before he got assigned one of his first big murder cases. This incident took place after the death of Trey Cooper and several other teenagers. Stubbs had an inkling that Jason Voorhees, or perhaps a copycat, was responsible for these murders. Later, Stubbs found himself at the Western Hills Psychiatric Hospital along with the others including Jason Voorhees. Eventually, Jason swung his signature machete at Stubbs when they were in the security station, which Stubbs managed to dodge. However, the machete hit the computer panel, sending an electric current into Jason's body. He took the opportunity and grabbed Stubbs, acting as a conductor, electrocuting Stubbs until he was dead. However, Jason wasn't entirely done as he threw Stubbs' body through a glass window. Freddy vs. Jason is a slasher film that had a very high count of murders by Jason. However, the death of Scott Stubbs was one of the more brutal ones. <laughs> Dance Floor Kill Friday the 13th, Jason Takes Manhattan, 1989 Eva Watanabe was a sweet, bubbly, and kind student who attended Lakeview High School and was part of a group which took the cruise to New York City. Her death, much like the others, was an unfortunate one and inevitable, but one must wonder if she could have bought herself some more time delaying her death at the hands of Jason Voorhees. (laughs) 
The incident takes place after Eva finds Tamara Mason's body dead in their shared cabin bathroom. She bolts immediately, running into the ship's hallway when she sees the mass killer, Jason Voorhees, standing there like a predator ready to kill. She runs up the stairs and finds herself on the dance floor with disco lights that almost cause an effect that keeps her feet on the ground. And that is when Jason bursts the door open. He waits. He stands still for a moment, giving her time to run and try to open the doors. But all her attempts are futile when she realizes she's locked in with a serial killer. For a very brief moment, she thinks he's gone. But he reappears soon enough, grabbing her by the neck as he lifts her from the ground, choking her to death. Jimmy Mortimer, pinned in hand with a corkscrew and struck in the face with a meat cleaver. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, 1984. Jimbo, Jimmy Mortimer, is portrayed by Crispin Glover and is one of the teenagers who rented the summer house on the Camp Crystal Lake grounds in the year 1984. Jimmy joined his friends on this trip after an upsetting breakup with his girlfriend Betty and is completely unaware of the fact that the brutal serial killer Jason Voorhees is on the loose. <laughs> They invite two girls over to join them at the summer house, and Jimmy hits it off with one of them and goes to gloat about it to his friend, Ted, and opens a bottle of wine to celebrate his success. He heads to the kitchen to try to find the corkscrew when Jason Voorhees appears from the shadows, slamming it into Jimmy's hand as he screams in pain, blood oozing. Jimmy barely has any time to register what has happened before Jason hits him in the face with a meat cleaver. His body is later found crucified at the back entrance by Trish Jarvis. And later, Jason simply walks through the back door, tearing Jimmy's body down. This death is just another proof of how Jason is, that even after killing his victim, he doesn't let their dead body simply rest in peace. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.